Clear uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point, that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent. The agenda of the African Union 2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities uh, that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent um, and many other opportunities that are provided. Et en 1963, il y a eu une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, où les chefs des institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer l'Association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc et la création de l'Association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. I'm Prof. Hassan Kafi, uh, AAU Governing Board Member represented, representing for East African region. Also, I am the president of Plasma University, Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in, in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world. And as we know, smartphone connectivity has already transformed much of the way how students are accessing higher education in Africa. So we will see what what kind of um, uh, uh, what what kind of experiences you now have in the continent, and uh, what do you think? Where are the bottlenecks, and and where are the the opportunities for the future? So everybody very much welcome and I give uh, over to Kaisa again. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. And um, as part of our project, um, I have authored uh, a policy note that actually was published this week. It hasn't been launched yet, but I'm um, sharing it here as a soft launch with you. It's called Resources, Relevance and Impact. And it talks about the key challenges for universities in Africa. Um, and, and it forms part of kind of a, a larger, I will share the link to it um, in an email after we uh, meet today. I think it shares kind of a, um, an idea of a larger context, just like Lisa was, was talking about universities are, are interconnected in the whole world, but um, we also see um, challenges being uh, the same all over the world, but also peculiar to uh, the African continent. And I was part of a webinar the other day uh, organized by the International Association of Universities, the IAU, 
uh, and this uh, professor there from Ethiopia, uh, Professor Tamrat, and he was talking about the previous normal and the new normal. So I, I borrowed a little bit from him and I added a few points. But I think just before we launch into the discussion, it's kind of important to contextualize um, a little bit. Uh, the previous normal for, for the continent uh, was growing economies for most uh, countries, some with the highest growth in the world. Uh, we could see kind of a predicted growth. Uh, we had a growing young population as well, which meant that ex economies were expanding. Uh, universities were having a key role in this uh, development, but of course access uh, is highly unequal, even when universities admit more students, uh, the share of poor students is still relatively small um, from poor households, and it's more the, the elites that have access to higher education. Uh, digitalization was budding, but also had huge barriers, such as low bandwidth, high costs, and of course, power irregularities. Um, our societies were interconnected, uh, but there was also huge dependency on foreign solutions. Uh, now we're into a new normal. Economies all over the world are contracting, but there's huge uncertainty. We don't know when this crisis is ending. Um, we don't know exactly how it will um, affect us, but we can guess that it will affect the, uh, the, the people who are already struggling more than than the others. Uh, we're now focused on protecting lives and livelihoods. Uh, universities have closed all over the world. Um, how did I have my numbers on that? Uh, I think it was, um, was it 9.8 million students on the continent that are currently not going to university as they usually were before. Um, so we have been thrown into online learning and working from home. Many countries are experiencing lockdowns and or slow reopenings. Um, and in the seminar um, with Professor Tamrat, he was talking about the silver lining that um, where the dependency was on foreign solutions before you can already see that now you're on your own. So you have to find local solutions and homegrown solutions. And that means he was suggesting um, um, a, a kind of a new approach, a new mindset. Um, so, that, so that was just a little bit of, of context to this conversation. And today we're focusing on access and digitalization. And I think with that, as planned, we're launching into um, the presentations a little bit early. Uh, Desire, can I call on you? Are you ready to share with, you, with us your presentation? COVID-19 lockdown, can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning for students with disabilities? The floor is yours, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, okay, so you have 10 minutes and I've asked Camilla to be our timekeeper. So she will let you know when you have three minutes left and then when you have one minute left and then we ask that you wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you too. And and those of you who feel more comfortable turning off your camera, you can you can do so. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Desire Chiwandire. I just finished uh, my PhD at Rhodes University focusing on the inclusion of students with... So the title for my presentation is uh, Lock, uh, COVID-19 Lockdown. Can South African universities guarantee quality e-learning? for students with disabilities. So basically, I was mainly interested on the issue of uh, how, you know, TouchSci has already provided the historical background, you know, on how universities internationally uh, have been forced to switch to e-learning, you know, for all students, including students with disabilities. So I won't provide much historical background uh, on that. You know, South Africa is one of the universities which has also resorted to e-learning, you know, and this is a new phenomenon, especially in South Africa and most African universities to having to focus uh, to adopt e-learning, you know. They've mainly been uh, contact universities. 
So if you look in the South African context, you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities, uh, this is a group of students who have mainly been excluded when it comes to educational opportunities. Why? Because more emphasis has mainly been uh, uh, focused on, uh, on their non-disabled peers. You know, if there's issues of curriculum, it's always curriculum from the perspective of uh, non-disabled students. So I think it's important for me to begin by defining uh, the concept of, inclusion, uh, of inclusive education. So the dominant uh, definition of inclusive education is supporting uh, learners with disabilities so that they are able to be involved with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. So mainly this is a concept which emphasizes uh, the need for students with disabilities to be supported, you know, on the same level with their non-disabled peers, mainly in what is often referred to as the regular classroom setting. You know. So very often it involves adapting the curriculum in, in order to ensure that, you know, students with disabilities are equally supported. So when we talk about inclusive education, mainly, you know, there's what I refer to as five pillars of inclusive education, you know. So if a, an educational institution can meet these uh, five, uh, five criteria, then it shows that, you know, that particular educational institution, you know, could be considered as a best practices in terms of supporting students with disabilities. So very often funding is one of the most important uh, aspect of inclusive education. And in South Africa, we've got uh, what is often referred to as NASFAS bursaries, which provides uh, funding for students with disabilities to access higher education and also provide uh, funding for assistive devices, any form of support which can enable students to succeed. The other supporting uh, mechanism is the provision of reasonable accommodations which varies depending on the student's uh, disability. Uh, you know, for, let's say for students with specific learning disabilities, this could come in the form of extra time. And the other aspect is uh, accessible built environment. You know, there is a need for universities to, to build uh, their uh, buildings in line with the universal design principles so that they can be accessible particularly for students with physical disabilities or mobility challenges, including those uh, with other disabilities. You know, this could be students with visual impairments. And there's also the provision of, us, uh, of assistive devices. This mainly applies to students uh, with visual impairments. And there's also the need to ensure that the curriculum is accessible to students with diverse disabilities. And this involves the role of lecturers. So for purposes of this presentation, I was mainly interested on the impact of uh, COVID learning, you know, through the lens of uh, students with disabilities and support staff members. So I designed uh, a questionnaire, like which had like uh, five questions, you know, which I forwarded to students with disabilities at one institution. And uh, I also forwarded it to support staff members. So in the questionnaire, what I was mainly interested in was to explore, you know, which academic year the student is and the faculty, you know, their disability and how the lockdown is affecting or has affected their learning. How their university is supporting them, you know, this could include lecturers, you know, tutors or you know, any relevant stakeholders within their universities. I was also mainly interested in potential challenges and opportunities of remote uh, learning, you know, that has been, that they are currently experiencing. So the questionnaire for disability unit staff members, you know, in Africa, they, of, they are often referred to as disability unit staff. But in other, in other settings, you know, they are referred to as uh, disability coordinators, but yeah. So I was mainly interested on in the measures that their unit are actually taking to support students uh, with disabilities. And uh, 
I wanted to hear from their opinions that which uh, category of students uh, disabilities with disabilities are more likely to be affected by remote learning and why. I was also interested on the support, you know, that the, uh, the lecturers and tutors are providing during the lockdown, you know, if they are doing any form of collaboration. And also I was interested in potential challenges and opportunities, you know, that could be uh, that emanate from the, from the lockdown. So from the findings, you know, the findings, you know, so basically five students responded and most of these students, most of all of them had invisible disabilities, which ranged from depression, anxiety, epilepsy, you know, and I used snowball sampling, you know, so I contacted one student that I know with an invisible disability who then referred me to her, uh, to her friends who also contributed to the study. So what I found, the dominant finding amongst students with disabilities, they felt that uh, the university tends to use a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, when it comes to the inclusion of students with disabilities. And this was more of like two-sided, that, you know, universities seems to focus mainly on non-disabled students at the cost of, of disabled students. Even within students with disabilities themselves, they felt that, you know, students with disabilities are treated as a homogenous group, you know. So with more attention pay, being paid on students with visible disabilities at the cost of students with invisible disabilities. So this is a dominant uh, finding. Even. Three minutes remaining. So the other challenge is that, you know, there was a, the dominant understanding was that you know, for some students, you know, there was a emphasis, especially from disability unit staff members that, you know, blind students and those with specific learning disabilities uh, more will be disproportionately affected in comparison to their peers. Especially because for blind students, most of them, they rely on assistive devices, you know, they have access in disability units. But now that they are learning from uh, home remotely, they don't have access to those assistive devices. The same also applies to students with specific learning disabilities who rely on scribes. Because they are working from home, they will be disadvantaged from that particular access. And also there is an issue of socioeconomic, uh, one socioeconomic background. You know, in South Africa, universities are divided in historically black institutions and historically white institutions. So participants from historically black institutions raised concerns about, you know, how most of the students live in remote areas. You know. So therefore, those students will be more affected when it comes to issues of uh, connectivity. Other participants, uh, disability unit staff members, spoke about uh, how first-year students with disabilities are more likely because, you know, this group is in its early phase because this was the first semester. So this group is in its uh, early phase of trans transitioning to university. So most of them are still learning about how to use assistive devices and all that. So they felt that, you know, this group will be more affected. When it comes to opportunities, you know, some One students... remaining. Sorry? One minute remaining. When it comes to some students, they felt that, you know, when it comes to opportunities, there will be flexibility, you know, because most universities are quite flex flexible on uh, deadlines. You know, lecturers are not supposed to impose strict deadlines as they will do if it's conduct sessions. So they felt that, you know, that's an opportunity that could be created uh, by learning from a remotely. And some participants uh, felt that the delivery of hard copy material could help them, you know, especially this participant uh, has epilepsy and she was speaking about how she can stay on the computer for a long time. Other participants felt that, you know, students with uh, physical disabilities are less likely to be affected by learning remotely. 
you know, especially if they, if they are learning in universities where there is, uh, which uh, the great environment is inaccessible. Uh, when it comes to some further that, you know, this will create an opportunity for lecturers to move away from their comfort zone, you know, especially because most lecturers in African universities, including South Africa, they have mainly been used uh, to teaching students through contact sessions. So this could encourage them to learn about how to use technology in order to support students from an e-learning standpoint. So in terms of conclusions and recommendations, there was emphasis that you know, students, uh, lecturers need to learn uh, about universal design for learning you know, so that they can be able to create and deliver the curriculum that could be accessible to students with diverse disabilities online. And lastly, there was emphasis on connectivity to say even though the universities are providing laptops, you know, to, to students with disabilities, it's important to emphasize the issue of connectivity because without connectivity, some students will be excluded. You know, so online learning could provide uh, equitable opportunities, provided these uh, adequate opportunities to ensure that, you know, connectivity is enhanced. So that's all from my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Desire, for your uh, presentation. Um, if there are anyone who has questions, you can write your name in the chat. Um, I had a question kind of relating to your last point about connectivity for the students that you um, did survey. What was their um, connectivity situation? Did they have um, a fixed line at home or did they get any help from the university or they use their phones? What was the uh, mode of connectivity, if you want? So for most of the students, you know, I think this has to do with uh, privileged, privilege, because most of this, all the students that I, uh, I interviewed are from a historically white uh, institution. So most of them seem to have their own laptops and the institution is providing them with data. So most of them don't necessarily seem to have any challenges with connectivity. The only issue that they had was the issue of not having uh, more opportunities to interact with their supervisors. And also remember, these are postgraduate students. They don't necessarily need to be on, uh, they don't use, uh, they don't have many courses. They're just focusing on, the, uh, on their postgraduate studies. Some of them are doing their masters. But it's a different aspect now to historically black institutions because in these institutions you find out that some students don't even have a laptop. Yeah. And they're okay. still waiting for the university to provide them with one. Yes, imagine to do online studies and online work, working from home without a laptop, that is um, a challenge. Thank you so much, Desire. I think if there are more questions, we have to push them to the discussion later on. And now we are moving on to Professor Stian Hoag Bay, and he will talk to us about partnership on a shoestring, how to foster sustainable research networks in Corona times and beyond. Stian, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kaisa. It's a great pleasure to be, be here. I've entitled my presentation Partnership on a Shoestring, and let me start by what I mean with that. I think that uh, uh, the partnership is the kind of term used a lot in uh, terms of development cooperation, in terms of uh, academic cooperation. But of course, partnership is also an implication and an expectation of having funding and institutional and muscles and resources in various ways. And uh, what I want to talk about is how to make a partnership on a shoestring on a, with a low budget, moving on, working in that sense. And I take as my point of departure, uh, the lab research laboratory that we have recently founded between Burkina Faso, Mali and Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, we call it Le Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Comparative Engagée et Transnationale. So uh, a, a research lab for the comparative, engaged, and transnational anthropology. 
And this is built up of a, a, a group of researchers who have been working together. We have been working for, for years, for a very long time. And finally, we felt the need to set up a research lab that can uh, be an umbrella for lots of our efforts. And we did so without a single dime. We didn't have any money involved in this because we have ongoing research projects. We have ongoing collaborations with specific individuals, but we felt that we need to have something that is beyond a specific program or a specific project and so forth. And uh, we, in this, in this research lab, if you set up a research lab without any specific funding, core funding attached to it, how do you do it? Well, you have to start with a shoestring. And the, the word for shoestring in French is also in English, by the way, lacet. Lacet, the, the, the acronym of the, of the lab, is also to signal that we are working, whether we have money or not, we are working. It's not that we are against having funding, but we, tr we find that it's important that academic cooperation and collaboration must be put to the fore. One way of doing this, and this has started well beyond, well, well before the corona times, was to set up a virtual seminar. So we have a, a virtual seminar that we have launched uh, in, uh, uh, b between these three um, uh, institutions in Burkina, Mali, and Uppsala. And we started as a virtual classroom. I mean, to have three classrooms connected through a video conference system. Uh, we did so, and this is to jump out of, the, of this uh, research lab, but we also have done so since last year with uh, our Mozambique collaboration uh, between Eduardo Monlane and Uppsala University to have an res ongoing research seminar, which is not spectacular, which is not fancy, but it's just the ordinary academic work that we do when we share papers, we read student papers, we are sharing viewpoints and so forth. Participants of these seminars have to, put, have to read the papers in advance. And by, to do this, we use, uh, either you can send out the papers, but often we use the, uh, some of the platforms within Uppsala University called Studium. So we create a, a space there. there. The reason why I'm bringing up this is because I think that when we are, and, and yeah, I should add, now we are planning for a Zoom seminar. So in two weeks' time, we will have two Zoom seminars, one with Eduardo Monlane uh, on uh, democracy and public engagement in troubled times, in times of crisis. And then we will have another one on uh, ethnographies of insecurity. Uh, the following day. So, so the idea here is that instead of focusing on technology, IT, ITC, and so on, we have to focus on pedagogy, pedagogy, what we can as lecturers, what research seminars, how to make it into a meaningful experience, not just into a second best option. Uh, so in that sense, I think that, uh, to echo what has already been said, I think that what we see in Corona times is that all inequalities that, that we already know and know well are getting more and more accentuated. Because online education requires connect connection. And I think it's worth remembering Jim, James Ferguson's uh, uh, distinction in his book, Expectations on Moder of Modernity, when he said that Disconnection is not the absence of connection, but is being not connected any longer. So it's this feeling of being disconnected. And I think we have all experienced that when we sit in meetings and all of a sudden nobody can hear what you say or you, you can't see the images or the PowerPoints and so forth. So in that sense, I think it's, it's so important that we, we recognize this and we also find what are the impacts for our, our own studies and our own research and research collaborations? And I would like really to, <clears throat> to emphasize, and this is my main point, that let's not focus on um, uh, software, but focusing on, I mean, ITC software, but let's focus on pedagogical skills, research skills, and how to do it. A third example of, of uh, doing a partnership on the shoestring or at least doing uh, handling this current time is that I 
I am giving currently a PhD course uh, at uh, Uppsala University, and one of the participants, Marcia, she will be talking afterwards. And in that PhD course, we have two Mozambican PhD students in Uppsala, two Mozambican PhD students in Maputo, and one Swedish student from Lund sitting in the US. So we have, we have been able to do this kind of, of PhD course uh, despite the corona times. And I think that is a promising thing. That's something that we should really use as an experience uh, later on. What we also do is that we record all the lectures in order to, if there is this connection, we can also be, the person can be, it can be possible for the person to look at the, the lecture afterwards. This is not to be spread. It's just me standing where I stand now. Not very welcome, and I, I haven't been to the hairdresser for a long time, so I don't want to be shared. Uh, it's not my best side, but I think it's, it's a very kind of functional way of approaching issues. Uh, I have two, two more points, and then I will stop. Um, one way that, that uh, um, corona has also impacted my, my work is that I have been contacted by uh, University Nazi Boni, which is the University of Bobo in Burkina Faso. Three minutes. Yeah, and uh, they have uh, uh, Professor Patrice Tue contacted me, and they are now going to launch a study of uh, studying the barrier measures taken by the Burkina Faso government and how uh, citizens, various categories of citizens, are experiencing all these uh, restrictions on uh, political and social and civic liberties that are taking place in the time of, of Corona. And I think that is a very innovative way of doing. And uh, gladly, uh, they got funding for this. And I will play the role of being a kind of advisor in terms of methodology, because I think it's, it's so important to also to look at what is going on. As for social scientists, we need to study this in one way or another. My last point. Uh, I was going to host a big conference on uh, insecurity, beyond the insecurity and crisis in West Africa, here in Uppsala in June this year. And uh, of course, this was extremely frustrating seeing that it was not going to take place. Uh, but we were wanted to look into insecurity in terms of military, in terms of citizens' insecurity, violence, uh, political turmoil, and so on. I think that a great impact of the corona situation will be that we will organize a, a roundtable on the corona pandemic in one way or another. So in that sense, I think it's, it will be postponed. We will do it later, but we will also try to find ways of dealing with it. And I think that the lesson we need to, the takeaway that I would like to stress is that uh, the world is as it used to be. It's just very different times we are living in. And that's why we should not start uh, uh, reassessing everything. We have to look One minute. what are the pedagogical skills that we need to develop? What are the research network that we need to, to, to work for? When we know that funding is insecure, when we know that we, we might have problems. So that's why we have to think innovatively about how to develop partnerships on the shoe street. Thank you very much. Well done there, Sim. Thank you very much uh, for your um, inspiring presentation. Uh, please write your name in the chat box if you have a question for, for Sian. I was thinking about um, when you do these seminars on a shoestring, do you feel like from your experience, maybe also from the PhD course you're talking about, do you need to meet in person before for this to work, or you can kind of start online? Is that possible? And so the question is kind of, do we need the personal meetings? We can replace them with Zoom and online technology, or yes, you, you, yeah, you're yeah. I, I, I think that, that uh, we would like to meet I would like to meet all of them. I would like to, to, to inter interact uh, normally with people. But if that's not possible, I think that 
uh, this opens up for an opportunity in the sense that we can also have chatting time. So um, uh, what we often do is that I open up the session at two o'clock as I open my, my ordinary classroom and then students and I, we can chat. And I think that uh, the Mozambican uh, uh, contingent, they are chatting about what's going on at home and the news from the country and so on. And then at 14 minutes, 15, and 15 minutes past, which is the academic quarter in Uppsala, then we start. And then we also, so we, we try to encourage this kind of social interaction and, and, and so on. Uh, I must say, and I think this is maybe, maybe an answer to your question, I don't, uh, we don't res record the seminar part of the session because I, I don't think that we should uh, making Big Brother looking at us every time. But I mean, as lecturers, you can give the lecture, you can give the presentation, but the discussion, you have to feel free. You have to, I mean, it, you have to feel that you can be uh, less thought through in the seminar setting. Thank you. Yeah, I think that reminds me of that time we're going to have an online meeting for the conference. You mentioned that now it's cancelled. And for some reason, I think a technical issue, you didn't show up uh, on time. So some of us were there waiting for you. And it was a lovely discussion before you showed up. Yeah. It was very <laughs> relaxed. Yeah. Um, Henning made a comment uh, in the chat room. I don't know if he wants to make it in person as well before we move on to midday. Was this issue about personal meetings? Yeah. No, no, no. But I, yeah. I, I, I don't think that this is a reason to to recon, sorry, so for reconsidering having uh, uh, physical meetings. Of course, but but I do think that we 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 should think, uh, reflect also on our our work. And for me, to give a kind of PhD course where access is possible for people across the world, is quite interesting because it could be much more specialized than if I should count on a student population in Uppsala. So I think that we, we have issues there that we should take uh, as, as, a, as, a, as an interesting way to develop our pedagogical skills. I think that's a very good point that there are like upsides to the virtual meetings too that you can have a, a larger reach so to say and a more specialized discussion. Uh, with that I think I want to hand over to Mireille uh, she is uh, talking to us about the COVID-19 pandemic and adaptation of higher educational digital technologies in Cameroon, where she is doing research and teaching. Mireille, welcome. Yes, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, let, me, let me switch to my PowerPoint. Okay. So, hello everyone, I'm Mireille Mangai Dimos, um, lecturer at the Department of International Politics at the International Relations Institute of the University of Yaoundé 2 in Cameroon, and I'm happy to be with you today to share um, exploratory uh, results <laughs> on, on, on what I've called uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, COVID pandemic and adaptation of higher education in Cameroon to digital technologies. So the outline on, of uh, this presentation is based on, I can say, three main points. The first point will be to talk about, to, to context, to, to locate higher education in Cameroon as one of the major entrepreneurs of the national strategic plan for published and adopted in 2016. Uh, for a realization in 2020. And then in the second part of my presentation, I will talk about the link between e -national, that national program, that is the e-national higher education program and e-learning Cameroon Public University in normal situation. Before now coming to the last point on the coordination of courses and programs at the University of Yaoundé, the personal uh, experience I've had during this uh, particular uh, pro, uh, um, publish, that was published in 2016 for a realization in 2020 in, uh, on the page 59 to 16, 61 has one of the major actors of, this, uh, of the digitalization proce process in Cameroon. And the objective of such plan is to ensure the availability of quality and quantity of human skills to, mean the, to meet the needs of digital economy and design queen preoccupation related to e-governance in the domain of education in Cameroon. Uh, 
So the opportunity regarding our uh, roundtable today, the op uh, I think this is uh, the opportunity to assess the role of uh, that particular ministry through public actions carried out by university in the domain of e-learning, e-education, and digitalization and research. So coming to the first point, e-national higher education program and e-learning public university in Cameroon. Uh, first of all, uh, let's say uh, this is the major policy reference of ICT development higher education, which is uh, called to respond to, to uh, seven axes. I, I can come back to it later if uh, it's necessary. And uh, this national uh, higher education, this national, this program has particularly contributed since 2016 to putting, in putting pressure on university <laughs> on designing, uh, uh, that have to design and modernize their website, the first thing, and other virtual pl platform for more societal visibility, inclusion, and democratization of information as well, as well as for more transparent administrative uh, practices. I explain. Since the program has been put in place, we have observed every two years a kind of evaluation that, has, uh, that is guided both by CAMES, which is a regional institution of higher education in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the ministry itself. This, uh, the second point is also that it has resulted for three years now in the student equipment with free laptops and online registration facilities. Regarding the free laptops, these are uh, mobile computers that are offered to every registered uh, student at public, uh, public university in Cameroon. And uh, another point is that uh, I consider this as uh, an absolute opportunity to open up to for opening up to globalization and the burden of public university visibility so the question that came into mind regarding the covid-19 uh, pandemic were about three <laughs> but i will try to answer uh, to them uh, according to my own experience uh, the first is, does this apply to all public university and higher education program in Cameroon? How do Cameroon public university embrace e-learning and digitalization in the context of COVID-19 pandemic? And to what may be considered in the COVID-19 pandemic context as the new normal, how do public university in Cameroon to, uh, uh, adapt to digital technologies? So, to answer to those uh, preliminary questions and exploratory uh, research, we have attempted to, uh, to, to examine key points, one key point, actions carried out by public university administration as well as lecturers and student reaction in relation to this, consider that uh, uh, major policy reference we mentioned earlier. And, uh, uh, after our preliminary uh, um, inquiries, what we've realized is that there have been rapid policy changes to a situation, in, a, in a situation where there was like, okay, uh, not real uh, uh, engagement regarding the, the, te the digital technologies. There have been having ha happy policy changes, prompt adaptation, and, but also reluctance or absence. Rapid development of public, mission, uh, of public measures. This has been observed through the, the diverse public meetings organized to try to find out solutions to the, to the context. There has also been design of e-learning platform within university website and for registered students. But while some of them are really functional from a direct internet access, others are not yet functional, but they are visible on the, on the university website, what is already quite good. The third point is the mobilization. Yes, the the third point is the mobilization of virtual platforms such as radio for teaching purpose in level four, level one and two students, and intense use of WhatsApp group 
to share courses and other educa educative digital contents. Another point is the organization of video conference for e-defense. However, in schools such as ERIC, the above initiatives are still limited to private master programs, which uh, most of them are engaged in uh, international cooperation with other university partners. In this particular case, we also observe that while some lecturers and teachers seem already familiar to professional discussion with their students using digital platform, others seem in a total process of adaptation. Some categories go used to the utilization of digital technology to share professional contents of all kinds, find it difficult to adapt themselves to digital approach to teaching and group interaction within a fixed hour period. But what has been surprising is definitely the capacity of all the categories to comply with the situation and overcome personal and societal challenge. Regarding the absence, uh, has a uh, result. In line with the absence, we have noticed that other public programs offered by the school uh, here in IRIC have been totally interrupted. Planning a resume only in June 1st, 2020 has announced by the government. Regarding, uh, but I think uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been a great opportunity to explore free online platform, digitalize, think about digitalizing library contents and acquire learn and um, and try to learn to use library databases. And uh, regarding the time constraint, I think I can hand here and come back to discussion later. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille. I think it's uh, great work that you've been able to start your research on, on actually how the COVID crisis is um, affecting um, the implementation of plans already there. Uh, very positive that they have been uh, fast forwarded. But you mentioned also problems of access, especially for your students. We, we spoke before today and you, you're running an entire course on WhatsApp. Uh, are all your students able to join that course, for instance? What are some of yeah. the, you can talk a little bit more uh, on, on problems yeah. of access. And then Mike yeah. has a question as well. Yeah. Yes, um, I can say if uh, uh, WhatsApp was the solution in that particular case because this was the the the, the cheaper the cheaper uh, uh, digital technologies available to students and uh, has um, has a virtual platform. It was also the 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 best alternative for the for the school that had that haven't got a a a, a a, a more modernized platform, virtual platform. And according to the experience I had, um, uh, the problem of access, what is interesting here is that the problem of access is not only, was not only linked to internet, it was also linked to energy provide, provide, provide provision, electricity, as there have been uh, many shortage, cuts of light, cutting light, uh, uh, things like that that have been preventing uh, that have prevented some students to to be present at times and um, attend the course normally. Me, even me, I've been victim of uh, that uh, electricity shortage. So I think what is interesting here is maybe regarding the digital uh, technologies. It's is close relationship with the use of energy, electricity, energy which is also a challenge here in Africa, in, uh, in Cameroon, in a particular environment. That's why I, I, I really focus on the problem of access, and I think this can be the contribution to the, to the debate, in terms of linking the, the, the both. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Michael had a question. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, um, thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. Um, I, when, you, when I was going through your slide, I was happy to note that um, since 2016, Cameroon has been uh, kind of getting prepared for such a um, pandemic. And uh, what I want to ask a question uh, from the universities, have the yes. universities done enough, like enough to digitalize the system? Like... Can the students get access to the academic result transcript to the university website? Also, yeah. the university, do they have like functioning Wi-Fi 
or Wi-Fi for the students because it, it's it's definitely have to start from the universities if they want to go digital. And secondly, the use of radio, like you said, in level three to three to four, they make use of radio. One to two, also yes. Also, mm -hmm. the part that radio uh, broadcast is limited to the view of only the presenter. Do you think like is uh, a very a good means of um, lecturing the students? So these my these are my questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, J. Michael, for your questions. And regarding the experience from universities, access to transcript uh, via online digital platform, and it, 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 it all depends. As I said, it all depends. There are some universities that have been able to adapt quickly because they on their website and platform, uh, this I kind of services already available online. For example, you can, uh, I can mention the University of Buea, the University of, uh, yes, the University of Buea and the University of Douala, uh, whom I was, I, I could realize yesterday running the website that they are really advanced. And from the university, in the University of Buea, for example, you don't need to, to move to the university to apply for a transcript. So this is, this all depends. It's really relative. At the University of Yaoundé too, that, uh, that may seem more equipped is during the COVID pandemic context that they have been able to adapt their platform, but they did it so quickly, quicker than uh, other universities such as Ngaoundere or Marwa. And now coming to online uh, platform uh, teaching or online teaching, University of Marwa has been able <laughs> to adapt quicker than Eric. That seemed more funded and more equipped than the University of Marwa. So I think it's uh, all depend, and there is a question of leadership also. I think uh, regarding the um, uh, the process of adaptation here, and uh, yeah, uh, the the question about the radio courses on radio. These are deserve to level one and two. Uh, students, university, and why uh, radio course? First of all, uh, look at the looking at uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, um, of the at the I don't know how you call effective numbers of students. There are thousands at university. Uh, this is a point I I needed to mention. There are thousand, almost two thousand, two thousand and five in level one and two. So it was difficult, according to exchanges I had with the uh, administrative uh, staff, is that it's difficult to interact in uh, using a platform to interact with 2,000 students at once, managing questions uh, on, on virtual platforms. So they just prefer a presenter, a, a lecturer to present the course and maybe uh, uh, get uh, two or three questions from the public intervening uh, directly uh, through the radio. And uh, regarding also the case of uh, WhatsApp groups, we observed that these are the kind of platform used only in small programs of 40 to 45 students, where it's more easier, though it takes like four hours, it's more easier uh, for, for one side or the other side, lecturers and students, to interact and have more close uh, discussions. So it it all depends, and I'm think, um, I think that from that particular point of view, there is a question of leadership. Who is managing? Who is what's the relationship to of the manager or main actor to the technologies uh, themselves? It's very very important. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille, and also for for um, shedding light on what is happening right right now. That's very current research. We. Get to take part of there. At this point, I wanted to hand over to uh, Ms. Ndo Muslamini of the Association of African Universities. Uh, Ndo, I think you have your um, video off, if it's possible to turn it on so yes. we can see you. Yes, there you are. Uh, so Ndomo, she is the Director of ICT Services and Knowledge Management at the AAU and therefore has a very particular vantage point to speak both from uh, from her organizational uh, experience, but maybe also on behalf of, of her members, the uh, universities uh, in Africa. So Nudomo, I give you 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Kaisa. 
thank you to the speakers that have spoken uh, ahead of me. And uh, as a discussant, I will uh, comment concerning inclusivity. Uh, I, I, I think inclusivity is something that we, uh, we have learned or has been emphasized through COVID-19. The fact that there are diverse groups of uh, students and uh, people that need to be taken into consideration. And the biggest challenge, as has been said, is the broad infrastructure issues that really lead to a, a challenges with equity and access. Um, and when we look at uh, some of these broad infrastructure issues, we need to remember that um, we must look at them at a campus level. If the campus infrastructure is weak, then that campus infrastructure cannot support uh, students and faculty remotely. And also there's national to reach the rural areas during COVID-19 challenges. Could you turn off your video to make the sound more stable? Okay, Thanks. let me let me do that. Mm, let me do that. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah. Let me stop my share. Okay. Uh, thank you. And now you can share the PowerPoint again. Yes, yeah. You can see it. Yeah. So the infrastructure issues need to be looked at at a campus level, at a national level, and also regional infrastructure level. And these uh, feed into each other. At a national level, we need our governments to be really looking at not just the urban areas in, 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 in terms of connectivity. For universities in Africa, we have what is called national research and education networks. Uh, the challenge is that they are not at the same level in, in terms of maturity. But uh, these institutions are the ones that are supposed to act as internet providers for educational and research institutions. So what we've seen during COVID-19 is that there have been negotiations that universities have been making with telecommunications companies to be able to address issues of connectivity for their students. Uh, the presentation on partnerships on a shoot string was very good, especially in relation to that funding has been prioritized to address uh, uh, health and other more urgent needs. And it seems like uh, education issues will not be priority for some time uh, until we fixed this uh, COVID. So as the Association of African Universities, we have focused our partnership strategy on advocacy and facilitation and providing expert advice to universities and helping them to verify providers, negotiating on their behalf, uh, speaking to some of the suppliers for consortium deals, that the universities could access. And we've also been doing a lot of capacity building through uh, webinars. Um, we are also learning that uh, mother is the necessity of innovations. I think for a long time we've been trying to push universities to progress the digitization of their teaching, learning and research and we thought uh, they were not moving fast enough. 
we also thought maybe the leadership issue we needed more charismatic leaders to be able to move this agenda but COVID has taught us that uh, when there's a need uh, people or institutions are likely to listen but we are seeing our investors in Africa not so prepared especially in terms of handling emergency responses we ran a survey uh, with the investors and they told us that the biggest challenge was responding fast enough so that they don't lose time and uh, we saw however that they handled international students very well and uh, we also learned that uh, some universities said they would be teaching fully the majority said they would be teaching partially and there was quite a big number which said we've closed and we are not teaching the tools that universities are using as the last presenter said they are using email they are using whatsapp they are using google classrooms they are using zoom and uh, in terms of content even though there's content out there from edX, Coursera and the like, uh, our investors are not yet using that. So we are trying to find a way to get them to look at that content and select what could be useful for them. But we know, of course, that academics sometimes resist using content that has been developed by other people. Learning management systems uh, are there. The challenge with the, them is that the universities had not institutionalized them. So they are having to revisit their institutional policies, which says uh, the use of the learning management system is compulsory, and most of them are using Moodle. Uh, we also Three see- remaining. Yeah, thank you. We also see a, a great need, uh, or rather our investors have been supporting their communities, developing uh, or manufacturing face masks or manufacturing hand sanitizers. In terms of high level research to find a cure, we find that there are a few universities uh, involved most of them are delegating their staff to participate in national uh, initiatives. So in conclusion, I think we agree that infrastructure is a big issue. Institutionalization of online education uh, is important. Even when COVID goes, we need to have blended approaches to teaching and learning. We think our investors should consider sharing infrastructure on the cloud in order to reduce costs so that they don't all do their own small things. Training, training, I think is very important and our curricula has been challenged. It must be skills focused. The way that we examine must be different we must have different ways of uh, assessing whether learning has happened. And then offline learning solutions are also becoming very important. Radio, TV, podcasts, sending materials to students that have no connectivity. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Nudungu, for kind of summarizing this um, conversation. Uh, I don't see that anyone has a direct question to you. Uh, maybe your role was more of a discussion. Uh, and I think we'll come back to some of these issues in our discussion um, a bit later. Now we're going to move to break and we'll return 10 past the hour. Um, in Sweden it's 12.10. Um, and I'll stay on here uh, if anyone wants to. Uh, chats, but I uh, encourage all of you to stretch and uh, um, do what you need to do to be refreshed back here 10 past the hour. So see you soon.
we, we can come back to this, you know, from time to time. We can come back to clarify all of this. Uh, we are going to get to, we have to go back to our concept note and say, okay, now I have come. Concept note. Where is the X here? What is my Y here? And what is, what really am I talking about? And one thing you will see and see and do and all of, all of that, Susan said it earlier, is really that by the time you are living here, even your concept note will not recognize itself. <laughs> and that is perfectly in agreement with what we want. We want people to be able to notice change and growth. So don't say, my concept note, I have submitted it, is in the record of Pasga. I can't change anything. Ah, that concept note is yours, but then it should not remain like that. So this is essentially what I finished explaining, isn't it? That we will establish a causality requires thinking about what an outcome would have been if the cause were not to be there. So, but again, you know, it's a bit sometimes quite tricky. You know, I just, I just um, harassed Valence a little bit now when he said the, pro the cause of the problem is people bring in refuse. And we say, okay, but then should they have eaten the refuse? No. Now, whose, whose work was it to have, to have um, yeah, yeah, you say, okay, it's the county governor or something, or county government. Yeah, but then somebody else, county government will say, look, we have the capacity to dispose of X tons. And that's why we appeal to farmers, process your food there before you bring it. Bring only the bananas. Don't bring the stalk that is holding the bananas together. I was in Ngong, and I saw that trucks were coming with only stalks of bananas. And they were whole trucks filled with, and that was the only thing they were. So you imagine if the farmers had disposed of that in the, you know, so can you also see that the farmers are also guilty, right? Yeah, now farmers will say, but if we do it, they will say our bananas are not fresh. Say these customers, eh? these people, these, they, they, they are not kind with us farmers. So you see, we can keep going and keep going and keep going. So how do we then, how do we then pinpoint a cause? Sometimes when I read Sluman, I like to read Sluman. And if you have read him only once, when you are not busy, try and read him again for entertainment. He, he has a way of spinning things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. At the end, you will feel, okay, now, is this guy saying we can never be sure what he causes? Because he will make you feel like that. But that is not his intention. And uh, maybe it's worth reading the whole book. I'm not suggesting that. But so it can be a bit tricky. And that is what we'll spend the next two or you know, so slides just trying to pin down. What should we note? What should we, what should be at the back of our mind before we say this is a cause? And that is not, that is not a cause. First is that, whether we like it or not, we have to decide where we put our analytical bricks. Now, somebody has injury in a factory, not here. Huh? You no, know the question we ask. I mean, this guy left home in the morning, everything was okay, and then he comes back with POP, plaster of Paris. And the first question the neighbors will ask is, what happened? Then he says, I fell. So fall is the cause, right? Yes. Injury is the, is the effect or the outcome. We used, we were, you know. Now, but then this fall was caused because, because he slipped. Now, normally when people are not drunk and they, yeah, they don't sleep anyhow, I mean, I know accidents happen. This guy slipped because the surface was was wet. You know those, the cleaners, they always put something there, wet surface, or yeah. But then the surface was not wet on its own. Surface will say, well, but it is not my fault. It is because there is a valve up there that is leaky. So oil came from this valve, ran on this surface. This guy was just going, the guy slipped, then he fell, and then the fall caused the injury. Now, leaky valve say, yeah, but don't blame me. This seal is supposed to have been replaced, but they didn't replace it. So it's still failure. And they say, Seal, why did you score F9? Why did you fail? You know? And they said, that because I'm not maintained. 
So you see, we can keep going back, back, back until we get to Adam and Eve, and then Adam said, well, it's the woman you gave me. <laughs> so. And then the woman says, it's the serpent. And the serpent, yeah, so, I, I wonder, I mean, yeah, God is... So we, we need to say, okay, all right, now, wait, I can't, this is Dandora, or this is inter-ethnic inter violence, or this is poverty rate, or, this, yeah, so this is something I'm trying to study. Now, for how long, how far back in the past should I go? So I, I, the analyst has to decide that, okay, well, all right. Okay, all of you stop there, you know. You know when the serpent said, well, yeah, is uh, when the woman said it's a serpent, God said, okay, I know the game. You will keep going. No. He didn't even talk to the serpent. <laughs> so because serpent would have mentioned something, and you really, it will really not end, you know. You know, it's like uh, our movies, Nollywood movies. When they don't know where to start, they say, keep, uh, watch out for part two. And then you wonder, can this have a part two? Seems this story is confused and confusing. So now, as an analyst, I need to decide, okay, at, where do I apply the brakes to, to begin my analysis? Right? Yeah. Uh, Joyce may be interested in, I have not uh, read your mind or your concept note, but if somebody, if Joyce is interested in um, in, in, I don't like bad examples. I was going to say inter-ethnic violence. But then, so you see, what caused this is, yeah, so you may be able to find a cause, and then find a cause that caused, you know, you, you, we can begin to trace that to amalgamation, 1914. If these different groups were allowed to go their separate ways, there would not have been these clashes. But then, so, so the question I sometimes ask myself is, okay, so what really do I think should, needs to be corrected? We cannot correct amalgamation. We cannot correct independence. We cannot correct the 1991-99 constitution. You know what I mean. So really, what really can we, where can we begin to intervene or interfere maybe? Uh, that may give me an idea of what my X should be, where really I need to apply my analytical, analytical breaks. So that is the first thing we need to ask. Where really do I stop in my analysis? The second is we need to understand that, that the tricky difference, the tricky difference between causation and correlation. Almost everywhere you turn, they say causation is not correlation. Yeah, causation is not correlation. But then let, let them continue talking. Then they are attributing causation to correlative yeah, uh, uh, factors. Correlation says, factors appear to be going together, right? So the more money is put in the, in, into education, the, ha, the better performance of students at high school exam. Okay, okay. So budgetary allocation goes up, performance at all level exams goes up, go, also goes up. Budgetary allocation goes up, performance goes up. If that is all we know, hmm, we are discussing co correlation. Two things going together or going down together or going up together. That, that is correlation. To go bit by bit, balance. <laughs> now, um, budget, budget, budgetary allocation goes up, performance goes up. Yeah. Or if that is all we know, that is correlation. Budgetary allocation goes down, performance goes down. If that is what we know, that is correlation. Budgetary allocation goes up, but then performance also continues to go down because now teacher salaries have been increased and instead of spending time teaching these kids, they go outside to eat pepper soup. That is also correlation. They will say that is negative. Increase in one is generating decrease in the other. All of that is correlation. That's not causation. It is the same thing here that fooled the lion. The lion was hungry, he saw the rabbit, he grabbed, eat him, and the rabbit said, no, okay, come on, bros. 
you can't eat me. I know you are strong and you are the king of the jungle and everything, but I know you are not a, a cannibal. You don't eat your own members of your own family. And Lion said, no, but you are not a member of my family. He said, but I am, me. And Lion said, then prove. He said, yeah, I mean, I am because anywhere other animals see me, they run. And Lion said, yeah, if that is true, then you must be. But I want you to prove it. And so they went, and all the animals saw them and ran. <laughs> <laughs> and rabbit said, bros, you see? Yeah, they are running away from me. Lion said, no, I want a repeat of this, ex of this experiment. Then they went to another place, they saw the animals, saw them, and then they fled. Said, I mean, you see, how many times do you want us to do this before I convince you? <laughs> they said, one more time. Okay, yeah, let's go. Then they went, and then animals saw them, then they fled. Lion said, I'm so sorry for all the troubles I've caused you, my brother. <laughs> I didn't know that we are from, yeah, I, how come I didn't know all this? Yeah, okay, so go, go, go in peace, bye-bye. So, Lion understood, Lion interpreted correlation as causation. Their appearance correlated with the fleeing of the other animals. So, they appear animals fled, they appear animals fled. But that is correlation. Then Lion said, a rabbit tricked him to understand that correlation as causation. I am appearing, and I am scaring them, and then they are running away for, for their dear lives. I always like stories that end you know, positively. So I like this story. And honestly, I wish it would happen to every rabbit like this every time. <laughs> yeah, again, which also says that repeat experiments will not necessarily prove causation if they are not well designed to prove that. So to move beyond this correlation, we need to establish what they call Z, a causal pathway or a causal mechanism that says this is how this produces that. So imagine, Lion then says, okay, I want you to show me how your appearance scares them. I want, but maybe asking such a critical question would have revealed the, the, the bitter truth. I don't like that truth to be revealed. <laughs> you, do you, have, some of you here in the toys, in Hausa, it is spider. No, in, in among, the, among the children of Anansi, Anansi, yeah, it's spider, right? Uh, so it's always the smaller animal, and the, in Yoruba, whatever, is, um, yeah, in Tiv, it is rabbit. And they always win. They never even die. <laughs> they drop tortoise from the sky. Imagine. <laughs> it landed here, broke its body. Hey, it never died. Uh, yeah, it's our own way of, we know we can't get justice in reality. So let's have it in our imagination. Yeah, but, but it's okay. <laughs> Sorry? All right. This is this is this is counterfactual reasoning. What will happen if the kings? Yeah, maybe. But they were very busy royal people, and then grew up maybe in royal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or maybe they don't even know that these stories were pointing at them. Anyways, so that is the first thing. So to move from correlation to causation, we need that causal mechanism. That is very important, and we'll talk about it. Uh, later. Three. The first one is we need to know where to stop. The second is that correlation is not causation. The third is we, when, we, when we think of a cause and an outcome, we must be very sure the direction of that arrow. You know, when we say X is here and Y is there, then we usually draw that arrow. Like that. So we say X, hunger, Y, fainting, and then we typically draw an arrow that starts here and points here. We have to be sure that that is where that arrow, in reality, it is where it is pointing. It is good once in a while to ask, can the arrow move backwards? Can it be the other way around? 
And in real life, sometimes we can, make, we, we can commit that error. This study, <sighs> this study this was, was conducted by these three people, and their title is, Are Women Really the Fairer Sex, Corruption and Women in Government? And they discovered that in countries where women in parliament are more, there is always low prevalence of corruption. And they are, so women in parliament, this was the argument, low corruption. That these women make laws and make, run committees and they hold clinical accountable and all of this and then corruption index is low. When it is the other way around, men, cover your face. <laughs> you have men dominating the, the, the parliament. Pa parliament and women like this. You see, this is how corruption will open its mouth wide. Service the woman. It's just a, okay, now, 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 that is, that is something you have said. <laughs> Where do we stop with this position? Yeah, so we need, yeah, I wonder. But the good question we can ask is, could it actually